Yeah, hey guys, sorry I'm late. Oh no, I understand that you were probably just giving me time to move to press the record button. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even going to say anything. Yeah, we thank you. I appreciate that. And we certainly don't need to get into it, but um, maybe people can figure out what's what's going on already. So, how have you yeah. been? <laughs> I've been fantastic. How have you been? <laughs> I've been better. Better. <laughs> That's okay. The dry run is always useful. That's right. I mean, the thing now is that I'm worried that I won't, you know, be as fun or engaging. <laughs> so don't, don't worry. I, I've actually, this is Glenn Gruber. I've come to, to join and screw things up so that, you know, all the pressure is off of you guys. Awesome. And for that, we thank you. That's right. The advantage of today is we also have a uh, Propelic senior mobile strategist, Glenn Gruber with us. Uh, so James Pluff, thanks for hopping on today on Device Squad, the podcast for the mobile enterprise from Propelix. Device Squad, fighting crimes against enterprise mobility worldwide. Bad UI, frustrating user experiences, poorly conceived mobile strategies, we defeat them all. This podcast series will cover all aspects of enterprise mobility, including strategy, development, design, testing, and more. My name is Steve Brickman. I'm a mobile strategist and UX architect with Propelix. First, a brief history of the company. Founded in 2011, Propelix is a mobile strategy consultancy helping enterprises worldwide devise true mobile strategies and develop world-class mobile applications across all industry verticals. Propelix clients include large companies like Amway, Bright Horizons, Bank of Montreal, Dubai Airports, Family Dollar, DLL, Cintas, Merck, and many more. Propelix menu of services includes eight different mobile kickstarts covering everything from mobile strategy and road mapping to MCOE to UI UX design to mobile testing strategy, along with soup to nuts, app design development, and support. Additionally, Propelix offers three homegrown enterprise mobile products. We have James Pluff, and James Pluff is a lead solutions architect at Mobile Iron. And as an information technology polymath, you have a reputation for delivering elegant, robust, cost-effective networking and information security solutions. Just a warning up front that there may be a spoiler at some point in this podcast. So I think this counts as a spoiler alert. James, why don't you just start it off by telling us a little bit about your background and how you uh, initially got into technology? Sure thing. You know, I had always played with technology as a kid. Uh, I think my first computer was uh, probably a VIC-20. And I remember it was a big, big deal in the household. Like our next step up was a, a Commodore 128, which is kind of a big deal. And so um, I, I've been monkeying around with computers for a long, long time. I kind of started working on them more actively, like, you know, fixing computers for other folks in my dorm room floor and, and building websites in college. And then I suppose you could say that I kind of turned pro uh, just in advance of the Y2K crisis, uh, where the computer industry was looking for any warm body who knew any sort of a thing about any kind of a computer. And uh, it was probably all downhill from there. Um, I parlayed that into a real job in desktop support, which I parlayed into doing some networking. And then um, I started to get into security because things like firewalls kept landing on my desk with the instructions, go set this up. And so, you know, I spent a lot of my career in consulting and enterprise IT. And uh, then, you know, a former colleague of mine happened to pop up this gig at Mobile Iron on LinkedIn a few years back. And he said, you know, if this looks interesting to you, hit me up. And I was like, well, I'm definitely not qualified for that job, but it he asked if it looked interesting. So I hit him up and he said, yeah, let's do this. And here I am. Nice. I think that's how I felt about every job I've ever had. Mobile Iron actually does security and management for, as our name implies, mobile devices, applications, and content. So we were founded 
back in 2007, started shipping product in, uh, I guess, 2009. And that is what we've done for our entire life. We've really focused on thinking about how organizations can embrace mobile devices for business transformation, but be able to do that in a way that doesn't put the organizations at risk. By the way, my first computer was a ColecoVision Atom. Oh, nice. Yeah. Glenn, what about you? Uh, actually, I, I think I, I lucked out because my dad had one of the first home computers. We had a IBM PC AT. Oh, Two yeah. floppies. Nice. It was good stuff. Nice. I was working uh, cassette wow. tapes. On yeah, the that was my uh, my jam on the the Vic Twenty too. Is the cassette tapes, and I remember getting an eight K memory upgrade for it that I feel like was the size of a VHS video cassette, but I bet it weighed a pound and a half. I have to say, we're we're skewing so old. There are so many people, uh, you know, who are going to be listening to this. It could be, what in God's name are they talking about? They're not going to have any like, idea. like stone tablets and chisels. I remember working you know, on uh, a Commodore PET computer. In the third grade, that was also a cassette tape based. Oh, yeah. Machine. Yeah, yeah. I think it's good, though, for folks to have some exposure to where things were, because I think mm -hmm. one of the interesting things that's happened with technology is it's gotten so advanced and sophisticated that like we're just sort of bored and we don't pay attention to it. Like I have a Raspberry Pi sitting on my desk. And when I stop and think about how it specs compared to like the first big desktop computer I bought for myself, which was in college, and it was a penny, and I was like, this thing's going to be awesome. And, you know, like, the Raspberry Pi has orders of magnitude more power than that thing did. And it's the size of a credit card. And uh, I think we should pause to contemplate on just how far we've come, just and just how fast, really. They're just omnipresent now. They're everywhere in our lives. And they're, you know, we've got supercomputers wherever we look now. It's exactly, a whole like in our pockets. Yeah, it's a whole other way of interacting with the world. Speaking of which, you've been doing a lot of traveling lately. I know you just got finished presenting in Singapore. What was that like? And what did you take away from that? You know, at the risk of going down a huge rabbit hole, uh, existentially, every time I travel, the thing it really reinforces is that, like, as a species, we have a lot more in common than not. You know, particularly that area of the world is interesting, at least through the, the lens of what I do day to day, because, for instance, Android market share is even higher there than it is in most places. And obviously, Android is the dominant OS, but extremely, extremely popular over there. And I was also talking to some customers that it was kind of interesting because there's also this tendency toward data sovereignty. And so there's actually much less cloud adoption over there than I would have expected. And I thought that was pretty interesting as well. Definitely a good trip. Definitely very informative. Definitely a very long flight. And you know, it's funny that we were talking about these machines of our past because there just wasn't much concern for security back then. And now it's it's really topmost on everybody's mind, especially with the uh, unfortunately named Internet of Things, which I'd like to get into now. Um, so the way we found you, I think Glenn actually found you from an article that you wrote uh, for Recode after attending the Black Hat Hackers Conference. And uh, one of the quotes that we pulled out of that was you said, quote, it doesn't feel like we're quite ready for all this stuff to be connected yet. Can you tell us about what you learned at the conference? and what it was like down there. Black Hat is, is always an interesting trip, and there are tons of things you can learn there, and they're, they're all over the map. There was a breakout session on cyber insurance this year, and, you know, of course, there's all the, the usual stuff where you're getting way down into the weeds about software and operating system internals and that sort of stuff. What sort of precipitated that quote that it doesn't feel like we're quite ready for all this stuff to be connected yet was actually a session on someone hacking a smart light bulb. And I, in my head, I was like, wow, he did a lot of really cool stuff to figure out how he could get at this thing. And then I thought, why do I need Wi-Fi in my light bulb? <laughs> and uh, granted, there are cool things you can do with, uh, with being able to control lighting from the supercomputer in your pocket. But kind of going back to your earlier point where we didn't worry about security as much, 
We didn't have to because a lot of times the security really was a question of physical access to the object. And when you start talking about the internet, like that totally changes, right? And so I think that's where it gets interesting is that where previously you would have had to have been sitting in front of something to do something bad to it. Now you can do that from half a world away. That's what's really interesting. That thread ran all through Black Hat, whether it was light bulbs or autonomous vehicles or, or just super well-connected vehicles. You know, everything seems to be getting an ethernet port or a Wi-Fi radio. And it makes me question whether everything really needs that. And when we talk about the risk of Internet of Things devices, what is the actual risk? Is it access to your network? I mean, what is the actual, the, the largest risk that we're talking about? There's a lot of different ones. The example of being able to unlock a door. Like we've seen evidence of smart home security systems that had vulnerabilities in them that would allow just that. And beyond that, weren't even able to be patched. So a vulnerability was discovered and there was no way to fix it. And when you're talking about a home security system, that's actually kind of a big deal. One of the other things that's been interesting the last little bit in the news, kind of going back to the risks, Krebs on security.com was recently the victim of the largest ever recorded DDoS in internet history. And a lot of that DDoS traffic was actually facilitated by unsecured or improperly secured IoT endpoints. Another kind of good example, because these were some of the devices that were used, is vulnerable cameras, actually. Uh, So if you think about that, if you have baby monitors or home security systems that use video, wouldn't it be fairly alarming to you as a person to think that someone could get access to that video stream? You know, when we think it's private, we're all pretty comfortable with that. But it gets very, very weird when it turns into Big Brother without your consent. The thing that I would also add on is when you're talking about like home security or consumer things, the threat impact, as it were, is fairly minimal because, you know, there's only so much you can do in an individual's home. But when you start to look at Internet of Things and you look at smart cities or how it's being used in industrial environments, you know, a lot of the yeah, these endpoint devices are actuators, things that turn stuff on and off. So if you think about being able to remotely open or close a gas valve at a factory and, or a water valve in a sewer system or water system uh, for a town or a city, like now I think you have a lot of significant impact to you know, the point of being able to get at video. If you think of all the cameras that are all throughout many of them just traffic cameras, um, to be able to track people like you see hacking in, like you see happen in movies these days, those are, I think, some of the bigger risks that Internet of Things portends rather than looking at the smart home you know, scenario. Oh, definitely. So we're actually talking about two different types of threats then. We're talking about the external threat from hackers, and we're also talking about the internal threat over the products themselves maybe not being ready to be connected. You know, we keep seeing these companies putting out products that perform crucial functions but are flawed and doing so like smoke alarms. I remember seeing a Wi-Fi smoke alarm that had a Wi-Fi battery in it and that failed and, you know, somebody's house burned down as a result and Wi-Fi door locks, as we mentioned, and then I read of somebody uh, whose door locks opened in the middle of the night and they thought that their home was being broken into. Do you think that the Internet of Things is presenting something completely new or is the management of these remote devices and endpoints just an extension of, of what we've been doing for years already? It's probably a little bit of an extension. There are definitely some questions when you start to dig down into it of obviously we're talking about a scale of endpoints that we haven't really dealt with in the past. Um, I think you've also got, you know, interesting issues of OS fragmentation that potentially play out because you've got all these different things and some of the things are going to be smarter and more full featured than other of the things. And so how do you address that? I think going back to Glenn's point about actuators, uh, when you're looking at Internet of Things, I think the other issue that potentially comes into play is 
kind of managing peripherals in a way that that we haven't before. And in this case, I'm using peripherals synonymously with the sensors that might be attached to these things, right? So you've got some device somewhere with an actuator or a sensor, and you need to know that the inputs from that are valid and can be trusted. And so I think those are kind of the new dimensions that you have to deal with. And then I think the last thing that you need to kind of tackle is the issue of connectivity. Most things are pretty well connected at this point, but not everything is going to be super well connected. And so, you know, you also have to tackle the management challenges of things that aren't online all the time, even though many of these things may be online most of the time. What do you think is the solution to managing all these devices? You know, can we approach this in the same way that we manage traditional mobile devices like smartphones and tablets and so forth? Or, you know, is the variety of operating systems that much of a problem when it comes to management, along with the, just the sheer number of additional devices? Scale is probably the easiest part of that equation to solve for, not to pound the mobile iron chest too much, but, you know, we have built out our, our management infrastructure for mobile devices to scale very aggressively, particularly in our cloud platform. The big challenge going down the road is how do you manage operating systems? Uh, we've seen that play out a little bit in the mobile device space right now, where in particular, Android has its notorious fragmentation problem. How do you tackle that on a larger scale? And so uh, I think there's some interesting things out there that can potentially help solve that. Like when you start looking at container solutions like Docker and other things that can sit on top of a native OS that you might be able to potentially address some of those issues. But certainly I think it's one of the, the big rocks to move. And at one point, you quoted one of my favorite comedians, also uh, Pat Oswald, uh, as saying, we're all about coulda, not shoulda. Could you explain uh, what you mean and uh, how you feel that that's relevant? The context of that bit, for those not familiar, you should definitely check it out. Not safe for work, but definitely hilarious. Is Pat Oswald is talking about an article that he read where the previous age record for birth was 62 years old. And now, thanks to science, it was 63. And so he's, he's saying, you know, we thought it was cool to do this, but we didn't really think through whether or not we actually should. And so his follow on joke is science, we've made cancer airborne and contagious, <laughs> you know, and uh, we're all about coulda, not shoulda. And I think some of that pertains to technology as well, right? Because we're, we're very quick to adopt and embrace technology, but we don't always think through some of the long-term implications. And I think specifically, like when we're talking about Internet of Things, you know, we're not really looking at what the risk versus reward trade-off for some of these things being so super connected is. I mean, obviously, I'm not a Luddite by any stretch. I've worked in technology my entire adult life, but I think we don't always approach things with the requisite caution and skepticism that we should. Right, which brings me to your next quote. It also seems like we're reluctant to acknowledge the inherent risk that all this connectivity creates. Um, I feel that's true about a number of things, and I wonder if it's just inherent to the human condition. I mean, when you think about fracking or autonomous cars, these technologies that we're, we just seem to be pushing ahead with fairly recklessly. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think there are certain benefits to pushing ahead with technology somewhat recklessly some of the time. And I think the example I would give there is the space program, which was really just sort of a dimension of an arms race. But, you know, we sort of decided, hey, uh, we should put some people in orbit and then we should go to the moon. And I'm not sure that we knew why we wanted to do that other than what can we learn by going there. And so I think there is something in the human condition that we benefit from that sort of recklessness because like if you just take it at face value, like why would we shoot someone, on, like strap someone to the top of a bomb and shoot them into a place where there is no breathable air? right? Like that's kind of what it comes down to. That's good. But like to your point about fracking, that's one of those things and some of the other technologies too, that it's sort of like, all right, well, we know that we're doing weird stuff to the earth's crust. 
it's probably hard to understand what the long-term implications of that are. And that might be one of the scenarios where, not saying we shouldn't do it, just maybe we should think about it a little more. There's a couple of different ways of looking at this. One is the problem that you're potentially creating is not my problem because by the time, you know, in the fracking example, it's really more of my children or my grandchildren or even their children's issue. It's not going to be mine. So it's a little kicking the can down the road, as opposed to some of this other stuff is just trying to push the boundaries of what's possible. I mean, I think there, there seems to be so much around internet of things that we believe that there's a gem of an idea out there, but we're not quite sure what that is, how it's going to manifest itself, what are the best opportunities. So we do push a little bit more to try and, and experiment as to you know, what works really well and what doesn't. And I will say that I'm a little heartened that around the autonomous cars, the uh, basic guidelines that car manufacturers should follow. And then also I, I saw just a couple of weeks ago, Industrial Internet Consortium came out with an Industrial Internet of Things security framework. And yeah, a lot of people involved in that, but it, it looked on, at characteristics around security, safety, reliability, resilience, and privacy. Those are kind of the five pillars there. And I thought that that was good that some people are trying to think through uh, some of the challenges and provide some guidelines to you know, the great mass of people who are experimenting at this point with the technology. I'm also very heartened uh, in my own way by autonomous cars because I have two kids of driving age. So when I look around and, and watch even some of my own habits from time to time, uh, like I'm convinced that people aren't very good at driving cars just categorically. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I started thinking, I, you know, I almost can't wait for autonomous cars, like a network of autonomous cars, because, you know, the machines theoretically would be programmed to not decide at the last minute that they needed to cut across three lanes of traffic to make a left turn. I'm a, a fan of Louis C.K. and there's a pretty good bit on that as well. He's talking about someone making a move like that and just sort of being like, I didn't know what else to do. Like I couldn't go up and turn around the block because it wasn't my favorite thing. And <laughs> I'm a big fan of that bit. What amazes me about this phase of autonomous car development is there just doesn't seem to be any real oversight. Like if I want to drive a car, I got to take that class and then I got to go take a driving test. And then, you know, I got to get yelled at by the registry cop and all that. But like where are the registry cops when it comes to these autonomous cars, they're not like requiring them to go out and sit in these cars and like test drive them around. I'm just, it's just amazing to me that they seem to be now like in a few different places being tested. Yeah, well, I mean, the DOT just put out a policy around that, at least recommendations of policy. This becomes a whole rabbit hole because you get into regulation and you get into federal versus state and also country versus country. It is a very difficult thing to try and even manage. At least for a bit, companies like Google and so forth and Tesla seem to be getting something of a pass. The technological advancement seemed to take precedent over safety of the people in the immediate vicinity. I mean, I think everyone does try and be thoughtful about it, but it is certainly a challenge. I mean, if you look back, what was it a year or two ago where someone basically, you know, hacked the Jeep that was just driving down the road, turned the car, you know, the car off remotely. I mean, there's so much electronics in cars today. I mean, it's great that all this technology is there, but it is now so much part and parcel of the experience of that vehicle that in some areas, you know, the software quality is still evolving and sometimes it's not always a great experience. And I think that's a great point that something that, that we really need to focus more on is because we have such a heavy dependency on software, dependencies we don't even always understand or acknowledge, we definitely do need to focus a lot more on software quality. Like when you kind of look at how do we address this at the most basic level, we really have to get better at writing code. To pull out another quote of yours, you wrote that some aspects of mobile security aren't nearly as dire as we may have been led to believe, while some are much, much worse. Could you just uh, take a moment to speak to which aspects aren't as dire and, you know, more significantly, which are 
much, much worse. There's a perception around mobile, particularly if it's made its way into enterprise, that somehow mobile devices are just the wild, wild west, and there is absolutely no way to secure them, like that it's just going to be a disaster from top to bottom. And I think when you start to really look at how they function and how they work, that's not really true. One of the things that I still find that there's a lot of misperception about when I'm out talking to folks is fundamental architectural things like application sandboxing is not really well understood, right? Like People forget that mobile devices don't have an open file system in the same way that our old desktop OSs did. And that by itself goes a long way toward minimizing the attack surface on these things. And so it's definitely not as bad as some people perceive. The other side of that coin is they're ubiquitous. They're highly connected. They're extremely capable, right? We said earlier in this podcast that you know, it's effectively a supercomputer, right? And uh, so, so they have a lot of capabilities, and I don't always know that folks are taking all the steps they should. Like, if they don't want them in their environment, they really need to kind of play fairly aggressive defense to keep them out. But if they do let them in, then there are certain things they should be doing that would help them operate more securely. Like we've been talking about software quality and security and that sort of thing. All of these guys, all the, the OS manufacturers, Apple, Google, um, they're, they're doing a good job getting patches out. But MobileIron in Q2 did a security and risk review where we looked at it and we saw that less than 10% of enterprises are actually enforcing minimum OS versions on their mobile fleets, which we thought was strange because you know, that's like one of the most basic things you can do. And it's free, right? So when you look at folks not doing that kind of stuff, that OS updates with the security patches aren't being applied when they're available, like that's an area that's definitely of concern. You know, here at Propelix, we you know, focus on the enterprise almost ex- exclusively. And in mobile and in IoT, security is usually far and away the number one concern of CIOs, given the fact that a lot of organizations have still a very long way to go into securing the devices that we're used to managing, like desktops, like smartphones and, t- and tablets. What's the advice that, that you might have or, or what are the things that you think that people should be looking out for when they want to move to bringing Internet of Things into their control? Like, what, what are some of the basic blocking and tackling that you would suggest and and maybe the things that you're seeing that people are are tripping up over? Probably the number one thing, if you go to the Center for Internet Security's top 20 critical controls, right? Control number one is maintain a list of authorized and unauthorized devices. The unauthorized part can be a little bit tough just because you often don't know what you don't know. But I think the spirit of that is the right place to start, right? It's become cliche kind of in the security community to say you can't secure what you can't see, but it's a cliche because it's true. When you're looking at Internet of Things in particular, and and even mobile devices, these things have a way of sneaking into the enterprise obliquely, right? They don't always come in through IT. A lot of times they come in through the line of business. And so you might have for example, a facilities department implementing a building management system, which has a bunch of Ethernet-enabled thermostats and air handlers and whatever else goes into those things, lighting control switches even, and IT may not have a ton of visibility into that. The thing that enterprises really need to make sure that they're doing is making sure they understand what is actually connecting to their network. I spend a lot of my time at MobileIron working with our ecosystem partners, particularly the security folks, and I've spent a lot of time with the network access control partners of ours. And I think some of the interesting things that we have seen there is, you know, when you you drop a, a NAC appliance into an environment and just turn on the device profiler, we've had scenarios where folks had 40% more network endpoints than they thought they did. And the profile of those endpoints was very different than what they would consider kind of their 
standard, whether that was IoT type devices or just a bunch of mobile devices that they didn't expect to see on the network. The starting point is you really do have to have some infrastructure in place so that you can accurately account for what is accessing your enterprise resources. I'm glad you brought that up because it just makes me you know, further think on a, a network side of things. Are you then seeing folks looking to segment the network, again, maybe to reduce the surface area of attacks so that you know, the connected devices are a different network than, say, the mobile and traditional devices? Certainly a best practice, right? Looking at greater segmentation. I think if you're dealing with a legacy network, sometimes the topology of those networks can make that a very difficult proposition for a lot of different reasons. Um, I do think that is an area actually, again, you know, where some of the network access control technologies can be useful because they can manage that in a more automated fashion. But I think anybody who is building a greenfield network that is not employing concepts of segmentation is doing themselves a disservice. I just think that going back to retrofit existing networks, it's definitely easier said than done. And it's one of those projects that I feel like would be hard to get authorized unless there was some sort of event that precipitated that, right? Where there was a breach and they said, oh, well, if we just segmented our networks and we could have avoided that. When you just look at it, taking that step from a preventative point of view, it's very hard for IT departments to get that type of project authorized. Has Mobile Iron added anything to the product and its portfolio to manage IoT devices specifically? There's nothing shipping in the product today. It is an area of quite a bit of focus for us just because we think a lot of the problems managing and securing IoT are not altogether dissimilar from the problems of managing mobile devices. And so we're kind of looking at how the market shapes up. I think one of the the interesting things is that, you know, there are a lot of IoT systems out there that already have proprietary management. And so we're thinking about how to tackle some of the more, I guess, open systems for lack of a better word. But nothing in the product today, but definitely something that's keeping the CTO office very busy. Okay. So is this the biggest risk that you see these days is this proliferation of uh, undiscovered endpoints? And what is Mobile Iron doing to approach this situation? We were kind of born and bred for the, the mobile device security and management. That's our entire pedigree. That's what we've been doing since the early days. We have always kind of looked at it through the lens of what you're really trying to protect is the data. So how do you secure the data as it moves from an enterprise premises to a mobile device to potentially the cloud? We've done a lot of things along those lines. It started early on with a product of ours called Sentry, which was effectively an active sync proxy, right? But it gave us a way to get in the mail stream to say this device is authorized or not. And, uh, you know, then make a decision about whether we were going to let it in or not. And, and Sentry has evolved to the point where it plays a role in an, another solution of ours that we call Access, which is really intended to help, um, you know, organizations as they make the move to the cloud uh, access is really designed to make sure that the endpoints accessing your SaaS infrastructure are authorized endpoints running authorized apps. So uh, it's definitely an area where we spend a lot of time. And I know that Mobile Iron has in the works now a new product that's going to launch up October 11th that will let businesses manage Windows 10 PCs like phones. So how does this fit into that whole scheme? or What are the benefits around this approach? The product we have coming up is what we call Bridge. But what we're seeing really that's kind of interesting is EMM is, is really the future for Windows 10 operations. Gartner is saying that EMM should be enterprise's first choice for managing Windows 10 devices. And a lot of that has to do with things that Microsoft started doing in, in Windows 8 and 8.1, where they 
started adding management capabilities that were very similar to what was available in Apple iOS and Google Android. And, and they've really extended that capability quite a bit as it's grown into Windows 10. And architecturally, Windows 10 now also supports sort of application sandboxing. Um, the caveat there is that there's a little bit of a gap between what can be controlled through the EMM management frameworks in Windows 10 and the way that enterprises have traditionally kind of managed Windows endpoints. And so that is why we have built what we call Mobile Iron Bridge. So what we're really trying to do with that is give organizations a way to, one, manage more granular policies. So you know, a lot of enterprises institute policies on Windows devices through Active Directory and group policy objects. And the EMM capabilities on Windows 10 aren't at parity with what those capabilities provide. So uh, Bridge gives us the ability to replicate some of those policies and do things like enforce actions using stuff like PowerShell. The other thing that it gives us is the ability to both edit and manage the registry, and also to view and manage the file system. So, you know, there's a lot of scenarios where organizations are relying on access to the registry to configure different settings that are required. Uh, the EMM frameworks don't permit that. And the same thing with the file system, being able to manage and see those things, get inventory, you know, you can't do through the EMM frameworks. So Bridge also provides that capability. And then the last component is being able to continue to support the legacy Windows 32 apps. So Microsoft, as I mentioned, has made a lot of strides to modernizing their application infrastructure. Specifically, you know, they provide sandbox apps. They have this notion of modern apps, which is kind of the new packaging method for applications on Windows devices. EMM can distribute those, and they can also distribute installers that are formatted with MSI. But if you just have a standard .exe installer file, those won't run through the EMM application deployment. And so Bridge also provides that capability. So what we're really going for there is trying to provide some infrastructure to help streamline organizations move to the modern EMM management paradigm for modern Windows OSs. So how about some low-hanging fruit help for some companies out there? What, what do you see as, as the most common mistakes that companies are making in terms of enterprise mobility management? Is it just monitoring the endpoint devices more carefully, or is there other low-hanging fruit that can help them avoid some common problems? The first thing is to really understand what your endpoint population looks like. But I think what we have seen in our customers and prospects is that they typically start out only securing and managing a handful of those endpoints. And the reality is that if you're going to let these things access your enterprise resources, you really have to have some way to control the data on all of them, right? And so you shouldn't be making exceptions for mobile devices in particular, because that's a great way for data to leak out. And I think you know, a lot of the concern may have been that folks don't want to go with a very heavy-handed approach, but securing your data doesn't need to be fascist, but it is something that as an organization, you definitely need to do. That's a, a common issue that, that we see when we go to clients where not only are they not thinking about it, but whenever they, an issue comes up and they try and figure out how do we secure this data, you know, it, it's kind of these ad hoc decisions as opposed to what we try and walk them through is to look at you know, what types of data are we talking about securing and then what would be the impact of a breach and therefore build policy structures around that so that the next time a new use case comes up, you can look back at you know, this kind of overarching policy uh, framework and apply it equally as opposed to kind of relitigating every single use case every single time and sometimes coming up with different answers at the same question. That's great advice for folks because it, it really does come down to what your risk appetite is, right? And if you can figure out what that is, it makes a lot of the decisions down the road a lot easier. Speaking of risk, you are in Flint right now, right? You're living in Flint? 
I am indeed. I, I live right downtown. And you attended the Baker College of Flint. So it just made me think about the water crisis there. And we've we talked a lot about um, how much risk technology can present. But in this case, you know, I can't help but wonder whether or not technology could have helped prevent the water crisis, whether or not it was, you know, more alerts towards the officials or, you know, at, at the homeowners uh, side of things. You know, that's a great point that certainly technology probably would have provided some earlier visibility into some of what was going on. I mean, there's a, you know, the water crisis has a long backstory and a lot of baggage. But I think the interesting issue there is that it comes down to kind of a technology access question. And so part of the reason that the decisions about the water were made had to do with trying to save money out of the city's operational budget. The catch is that technology can't be very helpful to you if you can't afford it. I think, you know, looking at it from the way that a lot of people would have viewed it, they'd have thought, well, why would we invest in water monitoring when we're trying to save money in these other places? When was the last time that there was an issue with the drinking water in the United States? Obviously, the Flint water crisis has shed a lot of light on problems in a lot of different places, but I don't think that was kind of the lens that we were looking at things through at the time that it occurred, right? And so certainly better technology, better warnings, more alerting, more accurate testing, all of those things would have been great, but they cost money. And uh, much as I love my city, I don't know that we have the cash for those things. And that's a, an excellent point because you see like these great ads by IBM about like smart cities and some countries like Singapore, where, you know, where you've got this central control and, and the government can decide to make these investments. But so many of the initiatives that a lot of cities want to take up cost so much money at a time when you know, budgets are, are tight or already in a deficit that it, it is hard to and I am totally not trying to give you know, the politicians in Flint the pass in, in no way, shape, or form. But you know, when you look at you know, the potential that IoT could have had, I mean, certainly with sensors in the right places and collecting the data at the right time, could have certainly solved it. But yeah, I mean, where does the money come from for some of these activities? Yeah, I mean, this is certainly a case where I can, I can envision some you know, Wi-Fi uh, water quality monitors in everybody's homes and then uh it you know the data goes to a central source where it's being monitored they can determine sort of where you know lead or so forth is being introduced into the system based on this micro sort of examination and then like if somebody's water is bad it, it'll send them an email you know and say hey stop drinking your water you know that though potentially speaks to another issue not that technology isn't fairly widely available, but I mean, you know, there's a lot of folks who have lived in Flint a long time. Like, you know, there's a a certain age of population, not to be an ageist or, or not running the risk of being an ageist, but that may not embrace things like email as much, right? And so I think that kind of underscores kind of another issue that it's good to have the technology, but if the, the alerts are automated in a way that I'm not going to get them, like it, it's still kind of missing the boat, right? And so there, I mean, that's what we kind of have to think about. I think that issue gets less important over time as we continue to get more and more comfortable with technology. But what if I am someone who doesn't really have email? How do I know? Like, where do I get the notification if, if I'm not a big technology user? Mm-hmm. All right. Can we just unveil the elephant in the room? So some of you, maybe the name James Clough seems familiar somehow. You may have seen it on Mr. Robot and that there's a character on Mr. Robot named James Pluff. I saw that and I thought, oh, this will be funny. I'll bring this up in, the, uh, in our recording. And then I realized that that character is actually named after you because you are also a technical consultant for this award-winning hacker drama. So I got to ask, first of all, how did you land that gig? It turns out that sometimes it's who you know before it's what you know. I actually used to work with 
Corridana, who is the, the tech producer and one of the staff writers on the show. And we used to get up to a little bit of mischief with their penetration testing tools. And he moved out to Los Angeles to pursue his fortunes. And I bumped into him at one point in LAX, actually. And he said, you know, I've got something in the pipeline coming. I don't have it locked down yet, so I can't really tell you anything about it. But um, if it comes together, can I give you a call with questions? And, you know, we stayed in touch even after his move. And so I was like, of course. And so ultimately, he did call from, from the writer's room with questions. It was just one of those lucky things that Cor and I kind of had a shared interest in security tools, but also a shared distaste of the way that hacking is often portrayed in popular culture. And Core actually shares that distaste with uh, the show's creator, Sam Esmail. And so they really hit it off when they got talking about that. And Sam and the entire team have been very focused on making the hacking very realistic. And the depictions of technology in general, actually, not just the hacking stuff. That was just a lucky break for me. They don't make you wear that mask. They, uh, they do not make me wear it, but the marketing department did send me one. So I have one in my office for those days when I maybe haven't shaved in too long to be hosting a video conference and you just pop the mask on, right? <laughs> That's intimidating. Um, has, working on that show, has, have there been any, any times where they've pitched you a plot idea and it's actually changed the way that you've thought about security or technology? Probably working on the show maybe hasn't changed the way I think about security so much as it's made me a little bit more paranoid. Just to reiterate the spoiler alert, starting out in season two, the first call that I got from the writer's room, like I picked up the phone and they're like, okay, so we're working on this thing. How do we blow up a data center? <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I don't know how you... <laughs> blow up a data center. I've never thought about that. And they said, why not? And I said, why would I? You know, it's those kind of questions that I think the objectives of F Society maybe are a little bit grander scale than some of the things that I've thought about in the past. But that was definitely a question that threw me for a loop because I was like, how am I supposed to answer that? And then how are we actually going to do this? So since that time, how many data centers have you blown up? Uh, well, that I, my joke with them at the time too, when they said, I was like, thanks for getting me on a list. You'll probably get my global entry status revoked because they hear me talking about this stuff. That's right. But, you know, we did actually figure out a way to do that, which went back to kind of my enterprise IT days. I had the privilege of being involved in a number of data center builds. And I, I remembered on one build in particular, one of the corporate safety guys was very, very skittish about the ventilation in the battery room. And I didn't really understand why. So I asked him and he's like, well, these batteries off gas hydrogen. And so if the ventilation isn't reliable, like a spark can just make the whole thing go up. And so that actually became kind of the basis for what we did. It's actually, ultimately, it doesn't occur in season two, but it's kind of the lead up to that in the in the season finale of season two. So with the explosion of batteries, is Samsung heavily featured in this episode or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, actually. The, in this case, they are much larger, more like uh, automotive or marine style batteries mm -hmm. that sit on big shelves. Nothing, nothing that exciting, though. No. The rule I heard is if your Samsung phone explodes, don't throw it in your Samsung washing machine. <laughs> good advice well Glenn and James thank you so much for hopping on and thank you <laughs> and so it's the same time tomorrow after this recording great <laughs> <laughs> after my, my laptop crashes in the next two minutes <laughs> and thanks everyone we've learned a lot here in this episode we've had some spoilers and we've had some good laughs so stay tuned for the next episode of Device Squad the podcast for the mobile enterprise from Propellix. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank Bye, you. guys. Bye-bye.